We now return to the Rayburn House office building. It's one of several congressional office buildings on Capitol Hill. Earlier this week, the House Government Reform Subcommittee on Criminal Justice, Drug Policy, and Human Resources met to hear about anti-drug efforts in Columbia, South America. Order and uh, we are on our third panel and our third uh, witness this afternoon. I know this has been a lengthy hearing, but it is an important hearing. And we wanted to hear the full testimony of our last witness, Mr. Lawrence uh, Mariage, and he's Vice President of Occidental Oil and Gas Corporation. I apologize, sir, for the uh, late hour, but as you can see, tremendous amount of interest in the subject uh, among members of Congress and uh, a great debate about one of the most important packages we'll be considering uh, this year. So uh, with that, I uh, thank you for your patience again, and you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have going to present a, a summary of my uh, written testimony. Without objection, that will be made part of the record. As the only uh, private sector representative at these hearings today, I want to focus my remarks on four key points relating to U.S.-Columbia relations. First, the importance of U.S. economic interests in Colombia. Secondly, how Colombia's increasing narcotics production problem is undermining those interests. Third, the importance of U.S. investment in Colombia in general, and particularly in the energy sector. And finally, our thoughts on the aid package. The U.S.-Columbia relationship of a great, is of great importance from an economic and commercial perspective. Colombia is our fifth largest, is the fifth largest economy in Latin America and our fifth largest trading partner in the region. U.S. exports reached nearly $5 billion in 1998, accounting for nearly 32 percent of Colombia's total imports. The As this Andean nation is our 26th largest export market overall. The U.S. also is the number one foreign investor in Colombia. Finally, Colombia is the eighth largest supplier of foreign crude oil to the United States, with more than 330,000 barrels a day shipped to Gulf Coast refineries in Texas and Louisiana. And this factor is an important uh, part of the uh, diversification of our energy supply away from the Middle East. In the more than three decades Occidental has operated in Colombia, we have seen a steep rise in the number of armed subversive groups in the country. Much of the attention today in the testimony has been focused on what is going on in the South. In the North, where we operate adjacent to the Venezuelan border, the number of FARC and ELN units has risen, have risen dramatically, particularly in the last five years. At the same time, in the same region, there has been explosive growth in drug trafficking. These two de developments are not unrelated. Along the border regions of North Santander, we have observed lush green terrain on the Venezuelan side and large charred areas on the Colombian side where native vegetation has been burned to clear the land for planting coca and poppies. The combination of drugs and guerrillas have resulted in a sharp increase in the level of violence in these regions. Mr. Chairman, economic development and the creation of jobs in the legitimate economy are essential if Colombia is to break this cycle of drugs and violence. The economy is mired in its worst recession in recent history, and one of the critical factors in the country's economic recovery is oil development, which has been a linchpin of uh, President Pastrana's plan for that recovery. Between 1994 and 1998, Colombia's oil sector accounted for nearly 23 percent of total foreign investment in Colombia. In 1999, crude oil sales produced nearly $3.2 billion in revenues or 24 percent of the central government's total income. But known reserves of crude oil are being rapidly depleted, and without new oil discoveries, Colombia will become a net importer of oil by 2004, which would have a devastating impact on the country's balance of payments, particularly if you're looking at uh, prices at the, the current level. Um, because oil revenues are so important to the government, Colombia's oil infrastructure has been a prime target of terrorist tactics by Marxist guerrillas who control much of the remote countryside where oil is produced. For example, units of both the FARC and the ELN have attacked the government-owned pipeline that transports oil to the coast from the country's second largest oil field, Canyon Limon, which we operate. The pipeline has been struck 
700 times since operations began in 1985, 79 times in 1999 alone. These attacks have caused cumulative losses totaling in excess of $100 million. Mr. Chairman, I share your view that the United States is confronting a crisis of dramatic proportions right in our own backyard. Indeed, we believe the very survival of Latin America's oldest democracy hangs in the balance. That's why we strongly support a substantial supplemental aid package for Colombia. Furthermore, we believe this package must be balanced between support for the police and the military. The 2,500 men of the Colombian National Police Anti-Narcotics Unit are badly outnumbered and outgunned by the guerrillas and paramilitaries, both of whom, as we have heard today, are supported by drug money. If I might add, just parenthetically, there's been some discussion today about cooperation between the military and, and the police and the, its essential component. We've seen this in the regions where we are operating at the present time. Indeed, for the, before the police can come into the areas in which we are operated that are controlled by the guerrillas, the first thing that happens is that units of the armed forces are deployed and then the police are deployed uh, subsequent to that. For the counter-narcotics activities of these police to be effective, they need the backing of the armed forces, which have their own shortcomings because they lack mobility, modern equipment, and intelligence gathering capabilities. The counter-narcotics battle simply cannot be won without a stronger, better equipped, and highly disciplined military force. I know human rights practices by the Colombian Army have been a central theme in this debate over U.S. aid, and they have certainly surfaced uh, during these hearings. President Pastrana has taken major steps to remedy this problem, and our own sponsorship of human rights programs in the areas where we operate has been an important catalyst. Finally, we are concerned that counter-narcotic support in the aid package exclusively targets operations in the southern part of the country. I believe it is important not to overlook the worsening problem in the north along the Venezuelan border, where an estimated 35 miles have been converted to drug cultivation in 1999 alone. Counter-narcotics activities in the north not only will undermine the growing source of revenue for the enemies of civil society, but also will provide indirect support for the government's effort to stimulate economic growth in the region. Attacking the source of supply is not the only answer in addressing Colombia's drug problem, but it is an important part of a larger equation that must be solved. Failure to act decisively now virtually assures that we will have to deal with a worsening regional problem in our hemisphere in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. In fact, I thank all three of our witnesses on this final panel. I'm going to uh, turn first to my colleague, uh, the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter, for his uh, question. I thank the chairman. Uh, first, let me <clears throat> say official hello to Ambassador Busby, who had one of the uh, great lines that I've repeated many times since because it was my first trip to Columbia and he was along. And I asked him whether the movie Clear and Present Danger was accurate, and he said, no, I died in the movie, which would also uh, go for uh, 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 Ambassador McNamara, who went through that uh, period, too. And I want to uh, say hi to him as a fellow Domer, uh, honorary um, uh, Hoosier. And uh, uh, also, I, ha I want to make sure you knew that Andy Downs was now chief of staff to the new mayor of Fort Wayne, uh, and because he, uh, which was a, a great honor at his uh, young age, because um, uh, your roommate and close friend, Dr. Downs, is his son, and they, yes. they won the mayor race, and all of a sudden his son's the chief of staff to the mayor of Fort Wayne. So uh, it's been great. I appreciate your knowledge over the years, both of you, and, and sharing that with me. And I also want to thank uh, Mr. Paraj for your testimony on the oil crisis and the interrelationship with the drug issue, because when you look at whether or not um, what constitutes compelling national interest to the United States when we look at this, you can argue about many things that we deal with in the world, but narcotics alone is enough for a compelling national interest. But when you talk about our energy, and every American right now is like, we had the gasoline prices in, in Fort Wayne go up 10 cents in one day last week. And everybody is more aware of the, the, the questions of energy. And we watch our number one source, which is not the Middle East, number one source is Venezuela, add that to Colombia, and you have a major amount of probably close to my guess is around 25% from those two countries, because I think Venezuela is 17. Um, and, and we have an energy question, not to mention the, the um, uh, Panama. But I wanted to first ask Ambassador Busby, I know that you made some fairly strong comments about the FARC. And I wanted to know, 
what your reaction was to the State Department in December of 1998 going down to meet with the FARC in Costa Rica. Uh, as you said, they're a designated terrorist organization. Uh, the State Department designated them that way. And uh, do you think it was appropriate for our State Department to negotiate directly with somebody that they had said was a terrorist organization? Um, let, let me answer the question a little differently. I, uh, you, you should understand, I don't have any problems in principle or ideological hang-ups with negotiating or meeting with people on the terrorist list. In fact, I did that myself at one time. I think if you can get something out of it, and you know what you're doing, I, I don't have an ideological problem with it. On that particular thing, and I really, I, I hesitate to say it, but well, let me put it this way. I, I think that if, if you are going to do something like that, you ought to have two or three criteria that you, that you judge its acceptability by. One, you should have a plan and you should have a strategy and you should understand what it is you're trying to do. You should have a clear objective and an end game before you do it. Secondly, I think you have to be well prepared. Meeting with a group like that, brief the Congress, think through the risk assessment of it, think through, make sure that when you go do it, that you've got everybody on board. And thirdly, it should be well done, well implemented. I don't have anything else to say about that meeting except that I don't think that it met my three criteria. Do you think they met any of the three criteria? No, sir. Ambassador McNamara, what, what do you, h how do you view how our State Department should approach things with not only the FARC but the ELN and the uh, so-called brightest paramilitary groups too? Uh, is that something we should be involved in? Let Pastrana go? Uh, do you have any further comments on the criteria that Ambassador Busby laid out? No, I think those are very sound criteria. I think <coughs> they, uh, when one negotiates, and I've spent almost my whole career negotiating, I started with uh, North Vietnamese and Viet Cong in Paris, and went on to, to Moscow, uh, negotiated with, uh, with people from the Arab world as well as from Latin America and China, uh, finished up my career negotiating with Panama. The, the question is to how you go into a negotiation. It seems to me that you go into a negotiation from a position of strength. The stronger party will come out of the negotiation better than the weaker party. And we, and, and President Pastrana, I think, started down a path without having, as Ambassador Busby just said, a good, clear strategy. Without the clear strategy, you're going to A, make mistakes, and B, uh, the stronger party, particularly if that stronger party has a good strategy, is probably going to uh, come out better for it. I stated in my statement that I thought that President Pastrana made a mistake in giving to the FARC that zone in eastern Colombia for just the very fact that they came to the negotiating table. That convinced them, and I think the the negotiating session in, uh, in Central America probably convinced them even more that they had the winning hand, they were the more powerful, and that Pastrana had to come to them and the U.S. had to come to them. That psychological uh, perception, I think, and allowing that uh, to uh, accrue to the FARC, as both Pastrana and the administration did, was probably, not probably, it was certainly a mistake. There's only one way to deal with these folks, and that is from a position of strength. Uh, I wanted to it, may I ask one other question, Mr. Chairman. It's, it's uh, and if you want to give some additional in, in written, because I know we've had a long day. But one of my concerns, and both of you have been ambassadors in multiple uh, other positions, as well as ambassador to Colombia, um, that. I sense that we are, are fighting a couple of battles down there. One is we've seen this huge tide of nationalism, which you certainly saw in the Panama Canal negotiations, where they probably would have been willing to negotiate, but basically popular will uh, is rising up. Then when we go to get another base, we can't find anybody that will let our military base in all of Central and South America. So we negotiate working out with, with multiple use of airports and off islands and all kinds of stuff. 
clearly in meeting with President Chavez, it's not the kind of, you don't detect a really anti-American tone, even to him who many people have concern, but more of a, they want to do their own thing, they want to have the pride, and it's almost like they feel uh, one way to assert that is to kind of once in a while do something that, to, you know, spite us or something. At, at the same time, they're really uh, many very strong supporters of the United States. They understand our importance in the zone, and they kind of think that, um, uh, so we have this, how to relate to us has become a huge problem. At, so we're seeing this tide of nationalism occur when we're seeing democracy in Colombia embattled. Fujimora, President Fujimora in Peru is looking at it and saying, hey, that's kind of teetering over there. I've got to control. It gives him, quite frankly, some questions about uh, he'd like to be continuous president and endangering democratic principles in Peru. Ecuador, which is right near the southern part, is certainly not exactly the most stable democracy right now after their procedure. President Chavez has got to be looking at the north side as we just heard about the dangers on the north border and more cultivation and whether they can control the north border. And he's got to be saying what's happening. This question of Colombia is spreading far more than just Colombia. And I'm wondering in the rising tide of nationalism, how we're gonna deal with some of that. If you could maybe just give a few insights and then if you wanna submit, because I think this is, this is going to go far past and more difficult than the plan Colombia we're looking at, because we're going to see this rise up all around it, which inhibits our ability to battle the drug problem, which we're all having in our streets. Well, I, I would comment on this. I mean, it's a very, I think, a, a, a very insightful and interesting question. Um, my, my feeling has always been that whether you're dealing bilaterally with a country such as Colombia or whether you're trying to put together a regional program, it is a constant intellectual exercise and struggle to find a meshing of their interest and ours struggle to find a meshing of their interest and ours. Nobody down there is going to do something just because we ask them. And that was one of the things I always kept preaching when I was in Colombia. They're not fighting narcotics for us. They're fighting narcotics because our interests mesh, and we're able to hold that together. And I think that if you look at it that way, then it comes back to our side. People expect us to lead. And we should. And you've got to find a policy, both bilaterally with the individual countries and regionally, that meshes with a good understanding of what they want. If you don't do that, then you're constantly battling both bilaterally and regionally, trying to get them to do something we want them to do, and we don't understand they can't do it. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that and, uh, and say that it's not unlike how you put together a political coalition in a congressional district, in a state, or here in the U.S., you find out what the interests of the parties involved are, what are the common interests, and how can the coalition hold together. It may hold together, uh, say, for example, in the NATO context for 40 or 50 years on a wide variety of issues, or it may, as in the Gulf War context, hold together only for a few months and for a single issue. In Latin America, I think that through the OAS and other institutions that we've built up, we can, in fact, have a long-term partnership, uh, not to say an alliance, because it wouldn't quite be an alliance, but a long-term partnership with most of the major countries in Latin America. And they will follow our lead, they, but they will follow us if we are a leader. If we're not a leader, if we're not putting out front the, uh, the essential elements of our interests and our policies and asking them and consulting with them on their interests and their policies, then, uh, then we're going to find out when the crisis hits, we haven't done the spade work that's necessary. You know, you can't put a coalition together and get elected to Congress on, uh, in, in July and August of the election year. You do that two or three years before, and then when July and August and November come around, uh, the coalition holds together. And it's not that much different in international affairs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Mariage, uh, you cited in your testimony some 700 incidents, I guess, of uh, attacks against your facilities in Colombia, and some 70 people, I guess, uh, 
Or 70 incidents uh, in the last year, was it? Uh, 79. 79. Uh, what's b been the impact on employees uh, of Occidental? Well, the attack on the, on the pipelines uh, from an employee perspective are really the tip of the iceberg. You know, there were discussions this morning about, you know, the economic impact of, of this aid package and whether a certain percentage should be put toward jobs. What our employees are confronting, and, and the workforce out there is exclusively Colombian in the field area, uh, is that they are regularly shaken down uh, by both the FARC and the ELN. They are required to pay a war tax uh, to both of the guerrilla groups uh, or they are not able to work. And that's the biggest impact that, uh, that we're uh, confronting with our employees. Have any of them been kidnapped or killed? Uh, yes. Uh, over the years, we have had uh, a number of instances where people have been uh, both killed and kidnapped. Nothing that has happened in recent, uh, in, recent uh, in the last two years. It also appears from some tape that we've uh, obtained from a uh, surveillance uh, company that some of the private sector uh, operations there, oil lines in particular, have been fairly effective in hiring security and also sort of monitoring and policing uh, their pipelines. Uh, uh, that is that left up to you pretty much to, uh, uh, to conduct that type of operation? The, the pipeline that's been attacked is owned and operated by Echo Patrol, the state oil company. And they are responsible for its maintenance and for its repair and for its protection. Uh, we are assessed a charge for that. Uh, so the protection is really comes uh, uh, from the Colombian Army uh, that is stationed out in that area. But the pipeline is 483 miles long. And so there aren't enough troops in all of Colombia uh, to protect that pipeline along its corridor. Has there been uh, any uh, noticeable decrease in oil production as a result of these attacks? I mean, uh, is there uh, a direct effect on the amount of oil that's available in the, the uh, market uh, due to these uh, recent attacks, or is this something that uh, isn't really measurable? Uh, it is measurable. And over the last two years, uh, with what we've seen as a dramatic escalation in the increase of attacks, at one time, Congressman, this, Mr. Chairman, that they, they had the, the uh, ELN was uh, primarily targeting the pipeline. Within the last three years, the FARC and the ELN together have been attacking the pipeline. And so we have seen economic disruptions for the first times, really, since we've been operating that field since 1985. Over the last two years, we have had to shut the field in completely. We've got about 500,000 barrels of storage at the field itself. When that storage is filled and the pipeline is still blocked, uh, then we have to shut in the field. Uh, and we've experienced those, uh, those incidents uh, three times uh, in, uh, in the last 18 months. Now, uh, the administration has crafted a package after consultation that has uh, military elements, it has police elements, it has some crop uh, eradication and uh, alternative development uh, elements. Uh, I'll just ask each of you, uh, if you were going to modify the package, where would you put a little bit more emphasis, uh, Ambassador Busby? I haven't had a chance to study the package. Uh, and I haven't really seen it in any detail. But the preliminary sheet that I saw on it, I think... Um, where would you increase uh, I I question the wisdom of the number of Black Hawk helicopters that's in that package. Okay. Uh, because of the infrastructure, training, logistics, that, that, that's a terrific machine. May and it's very complicated. Many. It's high tech. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder. Where, where would you put those resources? Uh, I think I would, I would look at some different kinds of, of lift, different types of helicopters that could be put on the ground quicker. Uh, that could be just as effective. Not to say you shouldn't have some Blackhawks in there because you need them for the altitude and for certain other purposes, but it just seemed to me when first crack out of the box, unless there's a real justification for that. Second thing is there, there's been a lot of discussion here about human rights. And I, I think uh, Ambassador McNamara, his, his phrase that the human rights abuses stem from the weakness of the state is right on the money. That is exactly right. 
I would probably put more emphasis, more money into infrastructure development, particularly in the judicial system, and increasing the ability, the investigative capabilities of the state to really enhance the rule of law. Because I, I think that part of the reason for a lot of human rights abuses is that people are so frustrated because they know that nothing will happen to people. So they take matters into their own hand. So I, I was, I, I looked at the number and it was, seemed very, very low to me. Thank you. Ambassador McNamara. Well, I, in my opening statement, I did indicate uh, two areas where I thought more attention needed to be given. One is indeed the system of justice in Colombia. The judicial system is, uh, is woefully weak and inadequate to the, the needs of the country. And I, uh, I suggested that the, uh, the three-legged strategy of Pastrana should be expanded to a four-legged strategy, and that fourth leg ought to be the improvement of justice. Uh, it, I, I made it a central theme of my years as ambassador in Colombia uh, to strengthen that judicial system. Substantial uh, efforts were made and I think some successes. In fact, bad as it is, it's much better than it was 10 or 15 years ago. It's still woefully inadequate. Uh, the second area, uh, and I'm not sure, so sure that in the immediate uh, ter uh, short term that it requires uh, huge resources, uh, it's not something that, uh, that you can just throw money at, but I think a strategy for dealing with the, uh, with the paramilitary organizations has got to be part of an early overall strategy for dealing with these problems. The paramilitaries are part of the problem, they're not part of the solution. And, uh, and while you strengthen the military, and in fact if you look historically, each time the military has been beggared in Colombia by one or another president, you've had a spike in the number of paramilitary forces and the amount of paramilitary activity. Each time the president, uh, whether it was Barco or Gaviria or now Pastrana, has put resources into the military, you have a diminution of the paramilitary strength and the paramilitary activity. It's, it's not coincidental that those two curves uh, are a sine-cosine uh, relationship. When one goes up, the other goes down. When one goes down, the other goes up. Uh, I think that uh, dealing with the paramilitary problem is something that we have not, we, the United States, nor Colombia has paid enough attention to. Thank and you. if I could make one last comment, uh, and again, it's not resources, it's strategy. This is not a U.S.-Colombian problem. It is a hemispheric and a regional problem, and we really have to spend time uh, uh, in answer uh, to, uh, to Mr. Souter's uh, question, being the leader in the hemisphere, getting the other countries involved. There are a lot of countries that would get involved if they saw the leadership and, uh, and responded to, uh, to Colombian and U.S. urgings. Thank you. Mr. Marash. As I indicated in my uh, uh, previous remarks, we're seeing a serious problem emerging in the north. If you fly up in, over, over the area of North Santander in a helicopter, you can see the smoke plumes from the fires burning where the uh, drug traffickers are burning. Um, I think looking exclusively to the south and ignoring what's happening in, in broader areas of Colombia is a mistake. Uh, there's another problem, too, if I, that relates to the regional issue uh, that Ambassador McNamara alluded to. We have an operation that, in Ecuador that's 40 miles from the Colombian border. Uh, there is some concern that if this push starts in the south, uh, a relentless, uh, relentless push in the south, what impact that would likely have upon uh, areas uh, close to the Ecuadorian uh, border as well. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank all three of our witnesses, uh, both for their patience and also for their participation. It's been a long day. I think we're uh, close to setting one of our hearing records as far as time, but this is a, a very important uh, a topic. Uh, it's going to be probably one of the most important packages uh, before the Congress in the next uh, few months here, hopefully even uh, faster than that. Uh, we've heard a little bit of today about the history of the situation, and it is unfortunate that some of you who did give us prior warning to the uh, threat and uh, the potential of a disruption uh, were not uh, heard and the situation has uh, dramatically uh, deteriorated uh, in, the, in that area. Uh, the important thing is that we learn by those mistakes and that we also address uh, 
uh, human rights not only there, and uh, that's been a great concern in the hearing today, but also the human rights of 15,973 Americans who lost their lives in drug-related deaths, most of those drugs coming from uh, this, uh, this area. Uh, that was in 1997, and we heard the drugs are today, say, 52,000 uh, in related uh, uh, incidents of death. Uh, the United States has put uh, forces in Somalia, Haiti, Bosnia, and Kosovo. <clears throat> and we did have a loss of 30 American servicemen in uh, Somalia, but we've never experienced anything domestically like uh, what we're experiencing uh, from uh, the deadly uh, substance that's uh, pouring out of uh, Colombia at this point. So it's important we don't make the mistakes of the past uh, that we uh, uh, put together a good balanced approach uh, that we help Colombians help themselves and in that way also help the United States rid itself of uh, some of the, the uh, deluge of uh, our drugs on, on our streets and in our communities, uh, killing our young people and uh, Americans across the land. So hopefully this will be the beginning uh, hearing and we'll have additional hearings with uh, different uh, committees. Uh, uh, but um, we will leave the record open uh, for additional comments for two weeks uh, with agreement uh, we'll submit possibly to uh, you three uh, witnesses also additional questions. I want to again thank you for your participation, uh, for your counsel, and, uh, and uh, again uh, ask for you to uh, work with us in the next uh, few weeks and months as we put this uh, pa finalize and put this package together. There being no further business to come before uh, the subcommittee at this time, uh, this uh, subcommittee meeting is adjourned. Coming up here on C-SPAN, America and the Courts brings you a discussion of the relationship between the media and the federal judiciary. Then a